Good morning. Please stand with me as we open up and turn your hymnals to 599 before the throne of God above. We'll be singing all three stances of 599. All right, good morning. Good to see everyone here in your places this morning. As you know, uh, Pastor Largent is not with us. He and his wife are on vacation, so keep them in your prayers if you would, please. And let's now go to the Lord in a word of prayer and ask his blessing upon this service. Our gracious Father, we um, agree this morning with the songwriter that you are worthy of our worship. And as we gather here this morning, we are so thankful that we do have um, your son, Jesus Christ, interceding for us. And Thank you that he has come and he has provided salvation for us. And because of your grace and your work in our lives, we know you and you call us your children. We praise your great name this morning and we thank you for this time, for this place, and for this opportunity we have to be here with our brothers and our sisters and our friends. And we ask now your blessing upon this time. Be with the many who could not be here this morning, um, those who are traveling, some working, and uh, some are ill and at home. We ask your blessing upon them, your presence in our service here, and may we glorify Jesus Christ here in this place, for it is in his name we pray. Amen. Please take your hymnals once again, turn to page 421. We'll be singing Higher Ground, all four stanzas of 421. Faith in heaven. 
good singing. Please turn back a few more pages to 553. 553, we're all, we'll sing all three stances of Come Thou Fountain of Every Blessing. Sun my flame. 
you stand with me and take your hymnals and t turn to hymn 309. We'll sing uh, all five verses of There is a Fountain of 309. <laughs> Normally at this time we would just have special music, um, more on that in a moment, but I'm going to give the announcements now since uh, Brother Campbell will be speaking this morning and he'll have a service at the end, so I'm going to take care of the announcements right now. So just for your information, um, there is a question about ushers that Pastor put in your mailboxes. If you've not seen that yet, please fill that out and get that back to him if you would, please. Then um, following the evening service tonight, uh, there will be a farewell fellowship for Lydia Daniels, who's going to play in a moment, so um, be here for that tonight if you can. And then men, there will be a men's Bible study beginning on July the 6th, second Tuesday. I'm sorry, not second, every other Tuesday. So every second Tuesday beginning on July 6th, and those will start at 6.30 in the evening. If you have questions, please see Dave Wormley about that. Um, our next youth activity is going to be Friday, July 9th at 6 p.m. We're going to have a game night here in the multipurpose building, so... For teenagers for your information if you hadn't heard that yet and then I believe that's it so our special music this morning is based upon hymn number 529 if you'd like to follow along thank you
I'll grab that. Well, good morning, everyone. If you were in Sunday school, then you got to hear a, a few things that I'm going to repeat, but I'll, I'll keep those things short. Sure. I'll keep those things short, but, uh, but just want to thank you so much for your support. Um, you support us uh, in our, our mission work in Peru, which is basically we teach. Uh, I teach at a, a, a Bible seminary there, and the classes that I teach, uh, I have a science background, so I teach uh, two biology classes, biology one, biology two. Biology one is a, uh, oh, it's basically about diseases. They, uh, the young people there sometimes have a skewed understanding of what causes a disease, and they sometimes don't see a, a cause and effect, but I have a feeling after a year and a half, they're going to, uh, of COVID, they're going to see it and understand the virus bacteria thing a little bit better, but uh, they have some unusual ideas as to what causes disease and how it's spread, and, and so that Biology 1 class, really it got started because we had uh, typhoid fever on the old campus, and um, then unfortunately we were kind of, we were reactive instead of proactive, and so we started teaching about how could we prevent, how could we have prevented uh, the typhoid fever from getting on campus, and so the next step was uh, to teach it in a in a formal class. And so we teach biology one, which is basically on diseases. Biology two has always been uh, a concentration on first aid. Uh, I'm an old EMT, so I uh, try to do teach them first aid Peruvian style, which which is really a lot of fun and and very practical. Uh, and, of course, uh, I talked about Sam, and I talked about Beth, and Sam and Beth are your missionaries, too, to Peru, and we work together. Uh, he's the director of the seminary, uh, and I said some things about him, and the only other thing that uh, I wanted to add, Wendy reminded me, is he's an excellent mentor. I mean, he just can relate to young people that may be, you know, having a little trouble here or may not be getting it quite yet for this study thing. He can take them aside, and uh, he can do a whole lot better job than I can, because sometimes the, the coach in me comes out and, and uh, you know, <laughs> having excuses about doing homework is not really, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not possible. I mean, you gotta get it done. Uh, but Sam, you know, he's more understanding and he, under, he, he just gets it uh, with the Peruvians. And I so appreciate that. Uh, and so he's been a blessing to me and, and a help to, to Wendy and I in more ways than one. Well, in fact, his whole family was. Uh, wanted to thank Dan just for kind of keeping me. He's he's always very. I got. I bet you his desk at work is like there's a there's a pad there and a pencil there and this there and this. Everything is in its place because he always reminds me of how to do things when I come and I so appreciate that because uh, I'm getting to the stage where I, I don't recall I don't remember things as well as I used to and so I appreciate that. And uh, of course Jeffrey and Wesley. Thank you so much for your, your work back there. I can't tell you how smooth this has gone. I've had times when I've done this, and it hasn't been very smooth in terms of the, uh, the, the transition in the slides. Uh, and that's when I was doing it. I had, the, I had the, the remote, and I would forget to change it. These guys don't forget, so I, I really appreciate that. And then one last thing. Uh, Chris? Yeah, he, uh, he pointed out, boy, I wish I'd have met you a week earlier. I would have saved a few bucks on this on that book I was telling you about. But I wanted to say this, because you can get this thing free, and uh, Maylene was, was asking me about it. Uh, I can't remember what I paid, it wasn't a ton, but there's, uh, I believe it's wmcarry.edu. Um, uh, but if, if, if you forget, and I'm not here, and you can see Chris, but anyways, he pointed out a website that you can go to and you can get this thing free uh, apparently, it's a, it's a foundation that just promotes um, William Carey materials, his sermons and stuff. And it's, I, I looked at it quickly, uh, the one page on the website. It looks like you could click on a, a number of things. But the bottom line is you can get this for free, and you could make it an e-book, or if you want to just run off the copies, you could. So anyways, you could get that free. Uh, all righty. Well, uh, as you can see, we're, we're moving along in our five-part series uh, on the sending of the Son and his church, uh, and it's all focused around missions, and I know I said this, but uh, it's, been a, it's been a blessing to me, a little self-serving, because I'm learning things uh, as I've been studying missions 
uh, pretty hard here over the last couple months because I'm putting together a class uh, for the seminary next year. I was asked to do that. And so um, I don't want to say I killed two birds with one stone, but I put together some messages. But I'm also thinking about how I can use this material uh, in, in the classroom curriculum. And so we have already listened to the introduction, kind of said a little bit about each one, the roots of Christian missions as we talked about the Old Testament, went back to Genesis and so on. Uh, then just this morning in Sunday school, the greatness of the Great Commission. And of course, the greatness is attributed to our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and then the sending father in the sent church is, is really kind of the heart of missions because um, it, it's all about sending, whether we're sending missionaries from our church or God sent the son or the son sends the, the, the apostles and so on. So that's where we are, and we're going we're gonna to pick up with the third message, the Sending Father and the Sent Church, uh, after we pray. Let's pray. Well, once again, Lord, thank you for this, uh, this time together. Thank you for a church and a people that love, that love missions. Uh, just looking at the number of, of missionaries that they support, it's really um, just from a, I say this in a God-honoring way, it's really impressive, the, the number of, of folks the number of missionaries they, they support. We thank you so much for that. Lord, we praise you and love you. And, and once again, go before each and every word that is, that is said this morning. In your son's precious name, amen. Well, um, this is just the format that I'm used to using. And I know it's a little different for you with someone standing down here. And I know Pastor Largent and I, uh, we may look a little bit alike, but we're uh, maybe a little different in our, in our approach. And I've always appreciated his, his messages. He's very... He's very uh, methodical, and uh, uh, I just really have liked them. Uh, so you can, I'll try to have the verses up there, and you're welcome to use your own Bible, or if you just want to read along uh, with what I have up there, because I've tried to put most of the verses that I use uh, up, up on the PowerPoint. So slide number two tells us that the message is the sending father and the sent church. Now, the aspect of, of sending and being sent is very prominent in uh, the Gospel of John, more so than any other Gospels, and even, even more so than, than the epistles. Uh, this, this idea undergirds the, the Great Commission itself. Before Jesus commissioned the church to be sent out, the Father had already taken the initiative of sending his own Son. Now, I know that's a foregone conclusion, but sometimes when you, you think about it and you stop, you start to see... Uh, you start to see kind of a, a progressive pattern in how the, book, the books of the Bible from Genesis and Revelation, they all make sense. I mean, they all come together and they all are, are very meaningful uh, individually. But when you put them all together, it's like, whoa, you know, this is, this is absolutely incredible. And that's what you have here when, when you read about God sending uh, the Son and then there's, there's understandings of, of being sent as we progress through the script, uh, especially as we progress through the Gospel of John. So, the Father had already taken the initiative of sending his own Son. The sending principle is also seen in the fact that God by nature is a sender. He is the originator of missions. That all begins with the Father sending the Son. The Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit. And Jesus sends the believers, you and I, the church, into the world as his witnesses. And that's kind of the, one of the premise, it's, it's, that's, our, that's our main premise. Now, John's understanding of missions is primarily found in his use of a particular verb, the verb to send from, from the Greek. Now, we don't have to worry about putting all the Greek and stuff up there, but there is a Greek word to send, apostello, that, that John uses a lot. And, and it's, it's, it's a word that, that has a lot of rich meaning in it. Uh, and John, John's entire gospel is structured around the Father sending John the Baptist, sending Jesus, sending the Holy Spirit, and culminating in his sending the church. And this verb that he uses every time he says to send from John's, uh, that he uses in John's gospel has two ideas behind it. So to the Greek mind, when they would hear this word to send, these are some of the things that would come to mind. Now, they don't readily come to our mind because we're just not, we, we just don't have the, the Greek backgrounds. There's two ideas in this word. 
One, one is called grammatically an internal idea, aspect, and one is called an external aspect. The internal aspect is, is that when the word to send is used and, and, you're, and you know the, uh, the one sending and the one being sent, it is, it, there's a personal relationship there. So when John uses this word, the word automatically in the Greek means that he's, he's telling us there's a personal relationship between the sender and the one being sent. And obviously that exists between God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This word says that the sender and the sent one, they know each other, important to the sender. Now, I know it's, it's amazing sometimes when a word, you know, one word can mean all that, but when you think about some English words, and, and you say them, you, you know, sometimes one word can have a pretty long description or a pretty long definition. And that's the case here. This word says that the sender and the sent one know each other personally and that what is being sent is important to the sender. So it's not just a frivolous thing that is being sent. When that word is used, it means, oh, I mean, this is important to me and I want it done and I want it done right. And I trust you to do it because I know you. Exa uh, then, so it's important to the, to the sender. Externally, uh, the verb, the same verb, epistello, uh, that means to send, means that the one who is sent is sent for some purpose. So once again, it's not just, you know, you know a haphazard sending. It's, there's a specific pur uh, purpose there, and because of that relationship, uh, it's going, to, it's going to get taken care of. And, and that there is, there is an expectation of obedience by the one being sent in carrying out the purpose. And so that's a pretty powerful, you know, send, sending phrase in all that it means. The son obeys the father. This reality extends to the church. The Father, as well as Jesus, from Matthew 28, 18 through 20, sends the church, and the church is to obey them both. That's our responsibility. And, and obviously, you know, you're very, um, you're very tuned into that, to that uh, obligation. You're being obedient because of all the missionaries that, that you are sending. Now, here are several examples of this sending idea from the Gospel of John. Now, there's 40 of them, and I, sometimes i got to be careful I don't get carried away. I'm not going to give you all 40 of them, but it does make the point, and, and if you would please, as you, as you read some of these or as you hear them read, just word, word. it means a lot. You know, it, it, it just, it, it has, it's supposed to have an impact on the, the one being sent. So these are all from the Gospel of John, and, and I'm going to read a few, and you can read all that you'd like. Uh, as you have the opportunity. So this is from the Gospel of John 434. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And so when you read that, you understand the purpose that, that Jesus was sent. He wasn't just sent in a meaningful way. He's going to finish the job. And then in verse 524, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Down to 733. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. The personal relationship. He's going to go back to him someday. Uh, he, he went back to him just as he promised. Then in 8.26, he says, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. And then on to slide four. A couple more verses I'd like to share. Uh, nine, four. I must work the works of him that sent me. So the son is doing the work that God has given him to do. And he's faithful and obedient to do it. And that's our example. That's the paradigm. That's what, that's what we should be doing. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. Because there's coming a day when we're not going to have missions. 
missions is going to be over, or your life is going to be over, and, and you won't be able to do missions. 1521, but all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. And if they knew who had sent the Lord Jesus Christ, and we know the Pharisees in particular struggled with that big time, they would have listened. They would have, they would have understood. And then the last one, but now I go my way in, in 16.5, but now I go my way to him that sent me. And, and none of you asketh me, whither goest thou? So he's going to go back. And uh, this is back in John in the first century course, and he's already gone back. So a few examples from uh, those 40 or so verses, but I do want to kind of, in my opinion, is kind of like the culminating text from slide 5, John 20, 21. These 40 texts, they all culminate in, in John's Great Commission. It's, it's not just that they culminate in a kind of a, um, a crescendo way. It's, it's also chronologically in, in John's Great Commission, like text of John 20, 21. Here is the last of 40 occurrences of the title sent one as applied to Jesus in John's Gospel with all that internal, external meaning. The, rec the resurrected Jesus says to his disciples, be, peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so I send you. And so all that personal relationship thing that we talked about between God and the Son, that same, that same material, that same stuff, if you will, exists between the Son and the apostles. And by extrapolation, it exists for all the disciples on down through history to us. Now, I shared a Timothy uh, Tenet uh, quote in Sunday School, and here's, a, here's another one from his book, Invitation to World Missions. He points out three commissioning to the church. And if you want to think about, you know, the Great Commission, commissioning, that's fine. But there's many other verses that speak to the fact that Jesus is commissioning the church to do the witnessing work. From John 21. And this is what Timothy Tennant, uh, you can read this in his book, Invitation to Missions, and he says this in slide 7. He says there's three aspects that he thinks that we should see uh, of Jesus commissioning to the church. First, the mission of the church is not a new thing. It's not a new development, but it's a continuation of the ministry of Jesus as the ongoing expression of of the Father's redemptive act of sending Jesus into the world. The Father's redemptive work is not finished with the ministry of Jesus. Thank goodness. <laughs> Obviously it's not. But continues to unfold at Pentecost with the coming of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church which eat with each and every believer and ultimately all the way in, into the new creation. He says this about the second, uh, the second aspect. Slide 8. The second aspect, according to Timothy Tennant, is this. The mission of the church is clearly set within a Trinitarian framework. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is there. Every time you turn around and read these verses, they're there. So the mission of the church is clearly set within a Trinitarian framework in John's Gospel. The Father is the sender, Jesus as the sent one sends the church, the Holy Spirit is imparted to the disciples, and you read this in the book of Acts as the Holy Spirit is imparted to the disciples because his presence will forever be with them as a believer. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit, indwelled by the Holy Spirit, so you have his presence, you have his guidance, and, and you are empowered for spreading of the gospel message. Sometimes... I've heard the argument, and I just don't, I just don't get it. You know, they, 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 say the argument, they, they say things like, well, you know, Jesus was talking to the apostles, and it doesn't have anything to do with me. But, but when you read it, it has everything to do with us because they were told to make disciples, and disciples make disciples. And that's what has happened on down through Christian history. Here is the third aspect of Jesus' commission to the church. This commission forms the basis for the ongoing sending ministry of the church in missions today. 
Just as Jesus, who was sent into the world, becomes the sender, so we who have been sent into the world continue to reflect Jesus' ministry as we send out workers into the harvest field. And, you, and that's what this church does kind of, as, as believers, we just kind of do that naturally. If you're a, a God-honoring uh, church, you're going to be doing that because you know that's what Scripture says. And as we have been seeing, this aspect of sending by God and Jesus is important as it's, a, it's an intimate relationship. It's a purposeful relationship that exists between the sender and the sent one. And that relationship should carry over, not, of course it carries over with your personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, but I believe it also carries over with the personal relationship that your church has with your missionaries as best you can. Now, I, I know that's not always a, an easy thing to do uh, because of distance and, and frequency of visiting, but you should really make an extra effort to, to know your missionaries as best you can. And I, and I really think you do. I don't, don't know the, all the ins and outs of it. But that relationship should be a personal relationship. It should be an intimate relationship. And as we have been seeing, this aspect of sending by God and Jesus is important as it's an intimate and purposeful one. And now, here are some verses that I'd like to show you uh, that show the obedience of the sent one to the sender, and it involves love and joy and intimacy. And so that wasn't just something I said to say it, you know, that you should have a personal, intimate, loving relationship with your missionaries. It's, it was said because that's what Scripture says. That's what God's Word tells us. So let's look at John 20, 21 to 23. 21 and 23. For example, look at what Jesus says in John 14, 21 and 23. You can read it. First, verse 21 says, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So there's, there's an awful lot of talk about love and intimacy as we read Scripture. Then in verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we will come unto him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. And so, love is an indication that you truly uh, are a believer. Love is an indication that you truly are honoring and respecting the Lord Jesus Christ, and and that you're going to be obedient. Slide eleven. Look at, or notice how Jesus says that the reason his father loves him is due to his ultimate obedience to the Father by dying on the cross. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. So the Son was being faithful, the Son was being obedient, and that is, that is an indication, as Scripture says in 1017, of a loving relationship. Slide 12, Acts 1.8. Wonderful verse from from uh, the, the empowering of the Holy Spirit from Acts. It says, The resurrected Jesus baptized the church with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And you can read about that in Acts 1, 4, and 5, and, and in chapter 2, 1 through 47, it kind of expounds upon that. To fulfill his promise that ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and Samaria, and into the othermost parts of the earth. And then as we move further along into Paul's epistles, into Philippians, Philippians 2, 3 through 8, we see Jesus as the example, uh, not just a great example, not just as a nice example, but as the, the epitome of, of all examples from Scripture of, of how to live your Christian life, how to do missions. Philippians 2, 3 through 8. We see this great example of Jesus, a humble servant, surrendering his rights, his privileges, for the sake of serving others to the glory of the Father. And that's what kind of being a missionary is. You've, you've gotten to the point where you're willing to surrender. Some of us probably do it better than others and to certain degrees than others, but you get to the point where 
you're trying always to put God first in situations. And, and, and obviously, you, we fail in doing that, but we're trying to do that. And that's where the sacrificing of being away from family, you know, and making it, sometimes it's harder on, you know, the grandparents when they're away uh, than, than it is on the kids themselves because they're so involved in their work uh, there. Um, and it was even more unique for us because uh, when we went, we were old already. I mean, I was a, trying to think if I was a grandparent yet when we first started back in uh, 2001. Our first trip was a short-term mission trip in 2001 uh, down to Peru to teach. And then we've been going ever since, except one year we didn't go in 2002. We had taken a quick trip to, we went with our, our new senior pastor at that time to Cambodia. Uh, and that was, you know, that, that was something I would just remind you of. You know, if you're thinking about missions, God prepares you. And you don't even know he's preparing you. And, and that's how it was with us. You know, uh, Wendy's organizational skills, she was an activities director in a nursing home for a lot of years. And those skills are just very significant uh, to use on the field. Uh, and then me being a teacher for such a long time and, and maybe even the coaching background, uh, I like to think helped a little bit in some situations. Uh, but he prepares you. And he may be preparing some of you right now for serving in missions in some, in some shape or form. And it could be cross-cultural. But as we look at Philippians 2, 3 through 8, we see the, the ultimate example for us all. A humble servant surrendering his rights. He was God, but he was God incarnate, and he went to the cross. He, uh, he surrendered his privileges for the sake of serving others. And that's what we, we try to do that too. And that was, being, that was Jesus being obedient unto death. So you had a chance to look at Philippians uh, 2, 3 through 8, the last verse is what I really wanted to, to kind of emphasize with, that has the underline that's underlined. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You know, and, and when I read verses like that, I always wonder, you know, and I'm afraid I always come up on the short end of this one, could, could I be that faithful? You know, could I be that obedient uh, to do something unto death? You know, where I had a conscious choice. I, 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 I be faithful and I listen and I do what the, what the Lord wants me to do, even though it means my death. I don't know. For, uh, slide 14 is blank, but I'd like to continue by just saying, it's really incumbent upon us. It's an obligation for us uh, to follow his example as best we can. We're, we're never going to be Lord Jesus Christ perfect, and we don't need to be. We don't need to be that perfect to be used. But we do need to set him up as our example and not set up a William Carey or a Hudson Taylor or whoever else that you think of when you think of someone who is serving mightily for the Lord. Don't do that. Because you know, one of the things that, that I found in this, these, this book that I, was, that I shared with you the other day is uh, you know, people like John Bunyan and William Cooper and David Brainerd and Charles Spurgeon, they had some flaws. Uh, some of them were significant flaws. And, and sometimes you start reading about those flaws and you say, holy macros, you know, how did they do what they did no, knowing, you know, having the issues that they had in their life? We all have issues. You know, we, we all have flaws. But God can use us because he can take those flaws and, and kind of turn them around and, and make them productive. So the point is, it's incumbent upon us to follow his example as best we can. We need to be imitators of Christ, even if it's difficult. The entire Bible is about missions, God and ours. If, as we've seen, there are many verses in the Bible that speak to the missionary experience about sending and being sent. And of course, there are many encouraging verses for missionaries in general. There are many reasons a person may be searching for a collection of passages on missions. Sometimes the church puts together verses and they have the congregation uh, read those verses 
and pray for their missionaries according to those verses. Sometimes the churches will send uh, those verses along to their missionary or just remind their missionary that they're, they're, they're reading those verses and they're praying up those verses for them. Maybe you, are, maybe you have a friend or a family member that's a missionary and you'd like to send them some biblical encouragement. There, I'm going to just show you some verses quickly uh, to do that. Thankfully, whatever God calls us to do, whether you're the sender or you're the goer, he supplies the means for it. He'll supply the opportunity, he'll supply the call, he'll supply the funds in ways that, you, that are beyond understanding. Just as God calls missionary, missionaries, he speaks to them throughout Scripture. I'd like to conclude with these thoughts and these verses that have to do with serving God in missions. So I'm going to be sharing some verses. Slide 15 just shows the BMM logo. You know, we're with Baptist Mid-Missions. Sam's with Baptist Mid-Missions and Tim and Barb Watley. You support missionaries that are with Baptist Mid-Missions. And, and uh, of course, I, could, I speak very highly of Baptist, Baptist Mid-Missions, not just their training, but their practical work they do in the country and, and helping us be able to, whether it's get a car or to be able to get property, that's the entity that permits that because you can't do it individually. You'd have to have an entity like that, and we do. So the Bible speaks of missions as a service to God. Declaring the gospel to the nations is always the natural fruit of Christian worship. Creation itself yearns to hear the gospel spoken. The nations so lost that they cannot even see their lostless. They don't even know they're lost. Deeply need God's mercy in the form of missionaries to bring them the gospel to bring them hope, and to bring them the message of Christ so that God can work in the hearts of their people. And as we move on to slide 16, I came across this quote from uh, ABWE, Association of Baptists for World Evangelism. Neat quote, because sometimes missionaries uh, are seen on bo- as, this, as this little quote starts. Missions isn't a vanity project, nor is it, and I, and I like this, and it isn't the janitorial work of the ministry. And sometimes, you know, it's seen on both ends. I, I remember this one time, uh, Dave Nelson. I, I can't remember the context. But he was, I think he was given a Wednesday. This is a long time ago. But he was giving a Wednesday evening Bible study time. I always remember this. Uh, Dave's a wonderful guy, loves the Lord, served him a long time. Uh, but he was talking about how people have interesting mindsets about missionaries. And, and here... You know, here, here was the mindset that he was trying to get away from. He said he knows people, he was talking about people who would take used tea bags, dry them on the line, and then send them to the missionaries. You know, and, and they thought they were being, you know, I, I'm not, I don't want to come across negative or, you know, I, I don't know. But they thought they were being, I don't know exactly what I thought they were being. But, you know, but that, that's a mentality sometimes that people have, that w- we, can give, we can give the missionaries, you know, whatever. You know, I don't want to say even second best, but we can give them whatever. And, 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 I, and I've learned that it shouldn't be that way. I'm not saying I want something new or nice. I'm just saying I've seen missionaries. You know, <clears throat> excuse me, getting by with not much, you know, and, and, and it shouldn't be that way. It, it, it just shouldn't. As, as best the church can support, same thing with your pastor. Your, your pastor shouldn't be getting by on a, on a wing and a prayer. He should be supported, and I know he does. I'm just kind of saying this in general. But, but sometimes, you know, uh, people have that mentality about missionaries, I'm afraid, that they're the used tea bag kind of thing. And it's unfortunate, and, and it's just, and I know you don't do that because I know you don't, but, but there is that, that feeling out there. But here was the quote again. Missions isn't a vanity project, and it isn't the janitorial work of the ministry. It is the crown jewel of Christian worship. Whoa, that's the ABWE blog that I read. I'm not even sure who the person was. Missions can be read about in the Psalms where David exalts missionary type service. You can read about it, of course, in the gospel like we've been doing quite a bit as Christ commands us to go. Paul's epistles are just filled with his tireless service to the Lord. 
And, and there are so many wonderful examples of, of missionaries that, that, that are on the field and they're there, you know, 12 months out of the year. Unlike us, you know, we come back and, and, we, and we just, you know, it, it's just not the same. Uh, but we feel very fortunate to even be called a missionary. I'm sure you have some other favorites, but here are some missionary encouraging verses. So I'm not going to read all of these, but these are some verses that, that you could have, that you could share, that you could read, and when you read about them, think of your missionary. 1, Timothy 2, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.9 For ye remember, brethren, our labor and our travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. That's what Paul's mindset. The only one that he was chargeable to, the only one he was accountable to, was the Lord Jesus Christ. And if he said somebody in a doctrinally way that hurt, a fe- hurt somebody's feelings, so be it. And that's how I think. Now, we have to be loving when we say that, obviously, but we, we can do that. Jeremiah 29, Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. In other words, he could not hold it in. He just had to talk about God. And as we look at the last couple, Galatians 6, 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now, we may not reap it in this life, but you're going to reap it in the next life. 1 Peter 4.10 As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. As every man hath received the gift. We're given spiritual gifts. Use them. We need to use them, whatever, whatever that means. And then the last slide I just have up there, uh, Peru update, and there were just a couple things that I wanted to say, and uh, if you should have any questions, um, please, uh, please ask them. Uh, but first of all, we just want to repeat, uh, thank you so much for your support for us, and, uh, and I know I've said this many times, but it's so unique, and I'm, we're so thankful. But thank you for your support to the Seminary's Work Study Scholarship Fund. Because we have a seven-acre campus where students can work all the time. And so we always have work for them. It's, it's like if, if they want to work, and most of them do, we, we have funds that they can do it. They can pay their $500 room, board, and tuition. And for that, we are just... I want to just close by showing you a, a different book. I want, to mention the, uh, I want to mention the other ones that I've had and then read a couple things. This is the series uh, from The Swans Are Not Silent. And um, if you're curious as to this series, I think there's, it's a six-book series. It may be seven book. But it's called The Swans Are Not Silent uh, series. And this is where that came from. When Augustine handed over the leadership of his church in A.D. 426, his sense of inadequacy that he declared. So, you know, this would be like Pastor Largen is stepping down after 30, you know, a long time. You know, very noteworthy time period here. Just wonderful. But the young man that's coming in, you know, he's he's seeing Pastor Largen look over his shoulder and it's like, whoa, you know. (laughs) It, he kind of gets overwhelmed. And so this, the new pastor says, says this. Uh, and so the, the new pastor declared, the swan is silent. And so it was, it was meant to be a compliment to Augustine that, you know, this elegant person, you know, the beautiful white swan was the metaphor, is silent. Uh, and it goes on to say, the swan is silent. Fearing the spiritual giant's voice would be lost to time. That's how that that new pastor thought of it. But Augustine, 1,600 years later, Augustine is not silent. Just like Charles Spurgeon is not silent. Just like William Carey's not silent. Their their writings and who they were in their life still is read and is still admired in the Christian world. And neither have these, and then it goes on to say, and neither have the men who faithfully trumpeted the cause of Christ after him. 
Their lives have inspired every generation of believers and should compel us to a greater passion for God. So anyways, the swans are not silent. That's the series. Uh, this one is about Bunyan, uh, Cooper, and Brainerd. Uh, Chris, we already talked about this. Uh, this is a book that you can get online, and it was wmcarry.edu, and you can get it for free. Um, this is another, this is a different book that I wanted to share, The Legacy of Sovereign Joy. It has three people. The three in this one are Augustine, Luther, and Calvin. And here's the, some of the things that you read in here that are just different, that you don't get. But here's a, here's a short letter from John Calvin, of Calvinist fame, uh, a letter from John Calvin, and he wrote it to five young Frenchmen that were about to be martyred. They were going to be burned at the stake for carrying the gospel into France. So you got these five young men that took the gospel into France. Uh, the Catholicism of France is going to see their demise. And John Calvin writes to them this note. He says, We who are here shall do our duty in praying that he would glorify himself more and more by your constancy, and that he may, by the comfort of his spirit, sweeten and endear all that is bitter to the flesh, and so absorb your spirits in him, that in contemplating that heavenly crown, you may be ready without regret to leave all that belongs to this world. And then the last paragraph, John Calvin says to these five, Now at this present hour, necessity itself exhorts you more than ever to turn your whole mind heavenward. These guys are going to die, and they did. As yet, we know not what will be the event. So he's saying, we don't know if, for sure if you're going to die, but since it appears as though God would use your blood to seal his truth, there's nothing better for you than to prepare yourselves for that end, beseeching him so to subdue you to his good pleasure, that nothing may hinder you from following whithersoever he shall call, since it pleases him to employ you to the death in maintaining his quarrel, he will strengthen your hands in the fight and will not suffer a single drop Ooh. and will not suffer a single drop of your blood to be shed in vain. So that's the kind of thing that you read uh, when you read these books and it's just you know, very, very meaningful. So, um, this is from the series, Piper series, the, the, uh, the, swan, the, the Swans Are Not Silent. The last book I wanted to show you, some of you may be familiar with uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, the old one, which was kind of like reading the old Pilgrim's Progress. If you've ever read Pilgrim's Progress, the, the, old, the original, it's like, ooh, it's laborious. It's really kind of challenging to read it. But there's a, and I'm thankful, there's a new Fox's Book of Martyrs, and it's, and it's just easier to read. Uh, plus, they updated it. They, they, it starts with the, the martyrdom of Stephen, and it goes all the way up into the 21st century. So if you're, if you're interested in missions, and you're interested in how uh, Christ's servants have suffered and maintained the cause over the generations, over the hundreds of years, this is a good book. But let's pray. Well, Lord, thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word. We just thank you for for faithful churches who are, who are willing and able to, to send folks out and, and for the missionaries on the other end that are out and about uh, serving in the front lines. Uh, I want to lift them up to you and just say uh, thank you for their faithfulness. Thank you for their willingness to, to be where they are, away from family, uh, away from things that are generally seen as comforting and uh, just more comfortable with, with more things. Uh, but we praise you. And uh, as always, I like to say, we count it a privilege to be able to serve you in, in whatever sphere of influence you give us, whatever that might be, in our school, in our family, in our place of work, uh, just whatever, Lord. If you lead us to cross-cultural missions, may we see that. May we be tuned in to your leading and hear that still, small voice. Thank you, Lord. We ask this all in your son's precious name. Amen. You're welcome. Stand with me, turn in your hymnals to 487. We're going to sing the first dance of Where He Leads Me, I Will Follow. 487. Mm -hmm. 
I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take my cross and follow, follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him, all the way. Choir practice at 445, and we'll see the rest of you at 6. You are dismissed.